Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. It's fitting in a lecture that goes under the banner of 21st century enlightenment to begin with Adam Smith. For it was Smith, philosopher, man of letters, economist and pillar in the 18th century enlightenment who breathed life into the idea of self-interest as a motivating force in society. In The Wealth of Nations, published in 1776, he argued that man had a propensity to truck, barter and exchange. He told us it was the self-interest of the baker, the brewer, and the butcher that would provide our supper, and that mankind was distinguished from the beasts, not by the gift of stewardship over the earth, nor through being made in God's image, but through our ability to exchange. The Enlightenment, of course, sought to do away with the dead hand of religion, looking forward to a better society, one driven by progress and illuminated by science. But it was still a religious age, and Smith's writing is a tribute to the unintended consequences and the power of indirect causes. In the 19th century, economics took on the shape of mathematics. Inspired by the heat equations of physics, the so-called marginalist revolutionaries argued that the diminishing marginal utility of a good could be calculated arithmetically. So the stage was set for modern economics when, in 1932, Lionel Robbins, then head of the economics department at the London School of Economics, dreamed of an economics that could offer a single, unified theory of human action. Economics, he wrote, is the science which studies human behaviour as a relationship between ends and scarce means which have alternative uses. Such ends might involve work and leisure, or sustenance and sleep. What matters is all that are purchased with time and most with labour, and that mankind does not have a sufficiency of either of these things. To my mind, there is something theological about any universal explanation, and Robin's economics is no different. We have been, as he put it, turned out of paradise. It seems that economics is the theology of this post-lapsarian man. In the work of the formidable contemporary philosopher Daniel Dennett, we see cost-benefit analysis elevated to a general principle of practical reasoning, through which evolution operates as life forms compare costs and benefits of one action with another. In Dennett's work, or in the wave of popular books explaining the world around us in terms of cost-benefit trade-offs, economics offers no less than the meaning of life. By such an account, we are all entrepreneurs of ourselves. We must understand every aspect of our person as a future revenue stream. When deciding to work or to rest, we must weigh up the costs and the benefits of each action. Our decision to invest in ourselves, whether by education or through a gym subscription or even cosmetic surgical enhancements, must be based purely on our estimate of the future returns available on that investment. We become a productive machine, valued in the same way as any other business asset. Our decisions, choices and life plans become factors in a perpetual cost-benefit analysis that we must focus upon ourselves. The 18th century Enlightenment succeeded in throwing off the weight of religion, it is true. But as this rational calculating agent becomes the centrepiece of policy endeavour and private action, it seems to me that we have found ourselves another master. Now, none of this would matter were economics no more than a manner of speaking or a mode of analysis. But economic ways of thinking leak into the real world through the way that we talk and the tools that we use. Often, we simply do not notice that we are being economic. The complexity of our modern world forces us to rely upon a multitude of devices that do the economic work for us. In the supermarket, for example, a multitude of competing claims, quality, taste, affect, even the circumstances of the goods production, are rendered down to a single label specifying what counts and what does not. Of course, the voice that shouts loudest from the label is that of cost, and we must trade it off against all other concerns 
dealing with intensive farming, say, or indentured sweatshop labour is no longer a matter of moral outrage, thou shalt not buy this product, but a finely graduated consumer choice. Supermarkets offer established hierarchies of labelling where improvements in the quality of the husbandry or of a living wage are reflected in increasing prices and consumers are free to establish the cost of their own conscience. In the supermarket, even moral virtue has an economic dynamic. The last three decades have seen whole sections of our society recast as economic, and their participants as these entrepreneurial, rational economic agents. Take higher education. Twenty-something years ago, when I was a student, university fees and maintenance were paid by the government on the presumption that educated citizens are better citizens. Now, of course, students must borrow to pay fees and to support themselves, the justification being that they, and only they, will reap the benefits and must therefore shoulder the costs. This dogma, and it is a dogma, of our higher education planning is self-evidently false. We all benefit from good teachers, from nurses, civil servants, research scientists, chaplains, bureaucrats, administrators, town planners, sports coaches and so forth. The list is endless, all of whom have received a university education and many of whom will be hard pressed to recoup the fees and the living costs that they have incurred. And those are just the lucky ones who actually secure a job on graduation. But that's an aside, for this talk at least. What matters are the consequences of such a change? These fees are just one part, perhaps a symptom as much of the cause, of a broader repackaging of education as a saleable good, a corporate export industry. The argument is clear. Making students into consumers will somehow make universities better. It will also, as any leftish critic will point out, open up huge swathes of virgin territory as profit opportunities for service firms and the holders of capital. But if students have to pay fees, we are told, a market will spontaneously arise as universities compete with one another for their customers. Access to higher education will be determined by the individual's own assessment of their talent and their possibilities, expressed in their willingness to borrow and pay their fees. All that matters will be the eventual combinatory effect of intellect and degree quality on the student's earning power. This degree quality will be signalled by visible indicators, such as school rankings, and, this is important, but not empirically obviously true, lower quality institutions will charge lower fees. In other words, the market for higher education will come to resemble one envisaged in the opening pages of an economics textbook. At the centre of this network sits the rational student-consumer processing information, studying lists and rankings, calculating the trade-offs between course cost and predicted salary uplift. Yet, none of this is expected to devalue or even to change the central task of the university, which is, of course, education. How can that be the case? If administrators are worrying about branding, architecture and visible facilities, because these are being assessed, because they're part of the metrics, then there is a real danger, especially in institutions where funds are short, where institutional positioning is precarious, that these things will take money from less visible, less immediately accountable goods, such as teaching and teaching support. And subjected to constant surveillance in their research and teaching, faculty will play safe, offering conservative scholarship and low-risk traditional teaching. And who can blame them, with their jobs on the line if they fail to deliver good publications and systematically reach high teaching scores? The losers, of course, are their students. Perhaps this is where we need a little enlightenment of our own. How is the good life to be lived? What is the basis of virtue? For Smith and his colleagues, reason trumped superstition and learning triumphed over ignorance. Quite right. But they left much unstated. Indeed, these Enlightenment thinkers inherited a respect for the hierarchy of family, of civic institutions and the state. Apologists for Smith argue that self-interest is a broad term that includes the interest of family and community. It certainly seems that Smith's idea of self-interest is not the narrow, calculative meanness that characterises 20th century economic man. The reverse, quite the reverse. Smith believed that sympathy for one's fellow was the basis of all ethical behaviour. 
in more modern terms, we might say that the good life is relational, that it is achieved in partnership with others. And we hear this not just from philosophers, but also from psychologists, from those who study relationships and public health. All agree that more wealth does not equal more happiness, and that isolation and loneliness are as destructive to our well-being as friendship and company are beneficial. Why then this obsession with rational economic choice in our public discourse, when it is distinguished by selfishness and isolation, those very characteristics that are so corrosive to us as people? We can already see the consequences in higher education. When students are recast as consumers, they start acting like consumers. But often, they do not see that there are different kinds of consumers, that buying groceries from the supermarket is a profoundly different transaction from embarking on a process of education that requires them to participate to the limits of their ability, their imagination and their emotional reserve. Many students come to see education as a set of targets, of boxes to tick, of work carried out at a particular level that will result in a qualification of a certain kind where the student simply has to consume and regurgitate pre-digested chunks of knowledge. Students will choose modules that they perceive as easy in order to get higher grades, which are worth more in the purely external sense of better employment offers and better salaries. Study becomes about memorising and reproducing while the higher order pedagogic goals of synthesising, critiquing and evaluating are pushed aside. But these are the skills we really need our young people to have that are more worthwhile to the students themselves in any context beyond the shortest of short term. Not all Enlightenment thinkers shared Smith and Kant's vision of du commerce. In 1786, an obscure Anglican cleric named Joseph Townsend enjoyed a temporary fame when he published his dissertation on the Poor Laws, subtitled By a Well-Wisher to Mankind, in which he campaigned for the abolition of the welfare measures of the time. Invoking notions of natural balance and order, he tells us a parable of dogs and goats set in Robertson Crusoe's island in the Pacific Ocean. According to Townsend, a handful of goats landed by a Spanish sailor, Juan Fernandez, as a self-sustaining supply of food for future visits, had come to become a reliable source of sustenance for the English pirates who preyed on the Spanish shipping. The Spaniards retaliated and introduced a pair of dogs, greyhounds, which ran wild, multiplied and decimated the goats. The remaining goats learned to stay on the cliffs, out of reach of the dogs, and, according to Townsend, a new kind of balance was established. The agile, energetic goats and dogs survived, while the lazy were left to suffer the natural consequence of their own indolence. Townsend concluded, and I quote, Hunger will tame the fiercest animals. It will teach decency and civility, obedience and subjection to the most brutish, the most obstinate and the most perverse. Perhaps that is what we see in students, imaginative, enthusiastic, good-hearted, even fierce young people, domesticated and tamed by the burden of debt. I'm afraid to say that Townsend and his ilk prevailed over the believers in sweet commerce. The 19th century economy emerged through the abolition of assistance for the poor, the construction of robust property rights over land and capital, together with the technological and organisational innovations of the Industrial Revolution. Machines, fearsome engines, factories, and those dark, satanic mills. It relied upon the displacement and near starvation of an entire agrarian population, transforming a rural peasantry into a source of industrial labour. Now that all goods and all products are organised for sale and purchase only through the market, a new creature of enlightenment is born. Homo economicus, driven by self-interest, abstracted from bonds of family, church and state, endlessly seeking efficiency in the face of the universal scarcity brought about by the market exchangeability of all things. The economic agency even reaches affairs of the heart. Many online sites allow users to search for potential partners using a mechanism that will be familiar to anyone who has ever used the internet to search for a second-hand car or a house. These interfaces offer a detailed menu of choices, allowing users to select partner attributes such as age, height, type of figure, hair length, 
hair color, interests, marital status, ethnic origin, religion, education, children. And at the top of the screen, in the top right hand corner, a counter lists the availability of matches. It tumbles downwards as you design your perfect partner online, until, eventually, you must trade off these desired characteristics and scarcity. This is where the Enlightenment has brought us. From the sweet commerce and peaceful visions of Smith, through the unsympathetic competition of Townsend and Bentham, and the universal mathematic economics of the 20th century, to the triumph of a certain kind of profit-seeking rationality in all areas of our world, even in our own hearts. We have become economic men and women, and our society is governed and organized by the maxims of self-interest and competition. That, I suggest, is the true cost of economics. We do indeed need a new enlightenment, a 21st century enlightenment. One that recognises that the good life is lived in relationship, through giving, through caring and through empathy. We need to guard ourselves against the casual solipsism of economic language or the habitual uses of the economic prostheses that structure our daily interactions. We need to get offline, get out of the office, to recognise that even waste and inefficiency may play their part in a life lived to the full. In the case of romance, perhaps, not every relationship has to be perfect, nor does every partner have to be just right for you right now. Risks, dead ends and failures contribute much to who we are. Arduous though it may seem, the fact that the process of finding a partner is not straightforward and that some effort may be required on both sides may itself be enlightening. Indeed, the whole dance might even be fun. We need to learn to question economic justifications when we're handed them in policy, at work or at home, asking who benefits and whether more efficient means fairer, more responsible or more just. We need to sustain those institutions based on altruism and challenge those driven by rational profit. We should learn to find time, to mess around, to do things for others or simply for their own sake. We need to rediscover amazement to step over our world-weary, cynical selves, and to be childlike once more. You may by now be wondering why a scholar of organisation is speaking in whimsical terms about happiness and the goods of life. Should I not step aside and leave such matters to the experts, philosophers, priests, and the columnists of the Daily Mail? Yet, it seems to me that much of our access to the good life is contingent on how we organise. We can organise for misery, that's quite clear. The engines and mills of the Industrial Revolution make that obvious. But we can organise for good things too, for creativity, for empowerment, equality and participation. Moreover, I put it to you that there is an iterative relationship between ourselves and our society. Our social arrangements change our persons and our understanding of ourselves feeds back into our social arrangements. A society filled by economic men and women becomes ever more economic, and within it, homo economicus proliferates. When the problems we face, be they climate change or the distribution of prosperity closer to home, are exactly those requiring collective action and of necessity some degree of sacrifice, the economic agent becomes a major barrier to action. Perhaps we should abandon economics altogether. We should not economise on love, or care, or even art. Altruism and civic virtue, love and care grow through exercise and are not scarce resources to be economised. Even waste may play its part. A life lived to the full will be replete with dead ends, about turns, experimentation and chances, far richer than a neat parade of rational, calculative choices. Let economic man be gone. I put it to you. That economics has little place in our lives. Let them be bounteous, generous and overflowing and richer for it. I wondered whether the extent to which economics has become so dominant is just because the benefits do outweigh the drawbacks or as perceived benefits and the challenge of that. So the dating site might be the people use it because they feel it's, it's more economical than having to spend weekends and weekends after weekend at a, at a nightclub. Or take something as simple as, or as complex as 
an organ donation or something like that, where it's a very difficult decision. You've had to, there is a lot at stake. You have to use some basis for making decisions around it. And therefore, at least this is something that we, it's agreed, it's universally agreed. You might not like it, you might have to change assumptions, but it's agreed. That, I mean, this is a key, key point. Yeah, of course, you know, people use online dating because it's efficient, because they're, they're stuck in the office. You know. And um, surgeons use very complicated algorithmic um, ways of deciding who should get what organ. And a lot of thought and effort has gone into these. Um, my, my gripe, if you like, is that economy has become a sort of prime virtue. So we say, okay, um, we, we will do this because it's more efficient, because we get more, more bang for our buck. And I don't think that's necessarily appropriate. For example, you, you, I do know that calculations um, as to liver allocation have been going on. Not, I, I don't know if this has actually come into, come into place, but I know that simulations were being run on the basis of something called population life years which is simply a, a cost-benefit trade-off. What is the way we allocate livers in order to save most, most years across the population? Well, it seems to me that that's a, that's a very narrow way of thinking, and I think you know, we should be able to have debates about how we, how we allocate resources. So again, in healthcare, um, quality of life year measures uh, proliferate and again, cost-benefit trade-offs and so forth. I don't think it's adequate to say we should, we should do hip replacements over dialysis or we shouldn't treat dementia. Or yesterday's example was we should put statins in the water supply, wasn't it, pretty much? You know, this is the, this is the wrong question. We should be engaging with some of the problems that are, that are behind it, some of the causes.